Okay, I've given you chapter four. You need to have your book by next time because I'm only giving you the first few chapters just due to the fact that it takes some people a longer time to get their books. But if you look at chapter four, and I'll, I'll show it to you on, on another screen, the last page is application options where you'll have to draw on it. So take a picture with your phone or whatnot. There are two separate uploads. Upload from page 46. Add all dimensions from text statements 1 through 6 as discussed in these videos uh, on the calendar in the next in the past class. So sorry about that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to physically draw that. And I'm going to go through that with you today. And I'm going to go over to chapter four now. And we're going to talk about general dimensioning symbols. And we're not going to go through the questions first this time because it seems redundant since we're going through them at the end of the chapter. But I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. And we're going to learn about some different things that maybe you haven't seen before. So one thing are are all these symbols and we know what a radius symbol is but what is a controlled radius that's new and a spherical radius and a spherical diameter a square symbol we know what a flat bottom hole symbol looks like and a flat bottom hole symbol with spot face that means it's cleaning it up to a certain diameter it will never have a depth it's just however deep you have to go to clean that area up to a flat in that diameter. And usually that's on a curved surface or on a fillet next to, you know, uh, something where you could put a washer or a, a piece of hardware down on there and it could tighten it uniformly across the face. The depth symbol, counterbore symbol, the X symbol means number of places or by when we're talking about angles. We have min and max reference dimensions and they're called driven dimensions in adventure because they're driven by other dimensions so that would be over dimensioning if you put that in again so it would turn out to be reference and the dimension or origin symbol is brand new to this to 2009 version so a radius is a straight line extending from the center of the periphery to the of a circle or sphere. And we know what a radius is, right? But if you look over here at the interpretation, the difference between it and a controlled radius, a regular radius can have reversals or flats. It can be imperfect as long as it's tangent to each side and it stays within its two radius limits, its largest and smallest limit. So reversals and flats means peaks, dells, you know, imperfections in that. A controlled radius is something that we might use, think about ball bearings rolling around this shaft. And so it has to be more smooth or you're going to really mess up those bearings. So it is much more controlled. It's more expensive to make, so we don't want to use that unless it's a special application. A spherical radius would be like the end of a valve rod. It is rounded all the way around in 3D. It's a 3D round. So it's spherical all the way around the rod. And it can have any kind of reversals or peaks and dells, as long as it stays within the boundaries of the largest and the smallest radius. Now, a square symbol is something that we can put if instead of putting 2x on something, if something is square in the x and the y, then you could put a square symbol if the tolerances are the same. If the tolerances are different, you want to split those dimensions out into x and y dimensions. But if they're the same, you could put a square symbol, and that's what they want us to do in the application option. When we see something like that, it wants us to put that kind of thing on there. It's trying to get us to apply everything that we learn in this chapter. Now, a counterbore is essentially a flat bottom hole, and it has a depth. So right here, what it's missing is its depth. And you can see that it doesn't have that there. 
but it will talk about that in a second. Like right here, it's talking about the depth right here. So we have to have a depth of a flat bottom hole. It never goes all the way through or we wouldn't have that flat bottom. Now we don't have to say through, we know that because if it doesn't have a depth, it's assumed to go all the way through. So a lot of times I like to take that off, don't put that on the dimension because I may need that extra space. If I had a curved surface here, and I put something on here that had fluid coming in it, it might not seal and it may leak out the curved sides. So on a lot of times when we have a curved surface and we're, and we're tightening something down to it, it will not tighten down, but just in the apex of that curve. So when we say we want a spherical, a spherical, I'm sorry, a spot face, it is like a flat bottom hole that has, uh, a certain diameter. So if I had a curve and I had a certain diameter, I'm going to use a flat end mill and I'm going to go down until I get that diameter on that face. Now you don't want to stop short and have it curved somewhere. So it, it really never has a depth. And you see that this has a radius of two put out there so you could have a radius all the way around it. So we could actually have the radius in the call out, which is a little bit different. And I've never seen that myself. A countersink we know um, usually has um, an angle associated with the second diameter. And that diameter for that countersink is dimension from the top face. That is the, that is the largest diameter it will be. And then it just chokes down until it meets the other hole. Now, in millimeters, um, countersinks are 90 degrees. So that's why it has a 90 degree here. And countersinks can have different degrees. Like um, I've used 100 degree countersinks on sheet metal because if you had an 82 degree, you'd never have a hole, especially on like 32 thousandths sheet metal. You'd never get to the hole part. It would just be a countersink. So the flatter that is, the more holding power we have, and uh, they're more expensive screws, and it's, it's you know, a special um, end mill to, to be able to make that. But um, you can have, even in imperial units, something different than 82 degrees, which is our normal countersink angle. Um, and then we have the number of places. So when we say 3x, we know that there are three on the drawing. If you had a large piece of sheet metal and you had all kinds of holes and they looked very similar, you might say indicated A or uh, marked A or something and mark those on the drawing. And we'll see our application option does that. We could also say two by two, which means two millimeters in each way or two by 45 degrees, which would be a normal chamfer call out. When we get into maximum and minimum, I wanna talk about how kind of crazy this is. And I've never used this. I could say maximum, um, you know, 0 0.01 inches for all rounds. And then it could go down to nothing. So when I say maximum, that is a maximum and the minimum is nothing. It's usually zero if you see that. So when would I ever design something with a radius that could have no radius at all? If I have a plastic injection molded part, I could say maximum of 0 0.01 inches, 10 thousandths uh, for, all, for all corners. So that means that if they wanted to go smaller than that, that's fine. And usually I want a sharp edge, but in injection molding, we have to um, put at least a fillet on there so that that molten plastic can flow. Because anytime it hits a corner, it's like a log jam in a river. It just jams up and then it'll start to create imperfections. In a minimum, when I say it's a radius of one minimum, the maximum is when it takes the entire surface down. 
you know, or off the edge of the entire part. So if I had something like this and I had a radius minimum and the maximum could take that, that entire surface away. And so I've never used that minimum at all. A reference dimension, we know what that is. It's never inspected to, it's never manufactured to. Um, it is just for reference only in case, and I've seen this used mainly in overall dimensions, length, width, and height, uh, so that somebody can calculate the volume very quickly instead of going and, and putting all those dimensions together to try and figure out what the maximum amount of material might be to quote a part. So I want to um, talk now about, let's go back to this, the dimension origin. This is a big deal, you guys, and we might use this in our drawings later when we're going through dimensional relationships. The dimension origin symbol is to denote without a datum. If you don't have any GDMT, you don't put datums on a drawing. So if you don't have any GDNT on a drawing, how do you tell someone which side to set down on the inspection tool and to measure from? So this says measure from this side to this side. So I would set that top surface down on the surface plate and measure from the surface plate. So it gives us a way to denote which way to measure when we have, if we just had you know, measurements like this with arrows on both sides, it gives us a way to denote which side we should actually set down to interpret those or measure that part. A part surface uses uh, used as an origin must be large enough to establish re uh, repeatable orientation with a plane for measurement. If a surface is too small or has convex form deviation, the part may rock on the reference plane and part measurements will include the effect of rocking. The dimension origin symbol is not the equivalent of a datum symbol. It is similar. It just helps you know which side to measure from. So the model coordinate system, why is this important? Because, you know, we have the right hand rule and we've talked about that a lot in the past, maybe in 1405. But when you use Y14.41 and you tell what the CAD model is on a drawing, then they should go to that CAD model and get almost all their dimensions. You might put GD&T or whatnot, or the critical to function dimensions. Like when I designed plastic parts, I would not put on swoopy curvy parts all the dimensions. I would put the model reference number in a note specify this standard and then put only the dimensions between the bosses with the holes in them you know the patterns of holes that connect to other things snaps um, ribs things that actually interconnect with other parts those are called critical to function dimensions so we would show our model coordinate system in our drawing so that people understand the origin of that part. If you guys look at this, you see the, the uh, coordinate system showing up in that. And then this says this right here with this model, and it should call out this 14.41-2003 on there. All right, and that is it. So... Let's look at our true-false questions. I think I missed a page. Let me go back. I think I missed a page real quick. I think I thumbed through this. Here we go. Diameter, spherical diameter, and square. So when I'm saying something square, um... Well, here's the diameter, right? Here's the diameter, and we know that that's shown from the side view. But when we have a spherical diameter, like the ball hitch on our on our trucks, you know, to pull a trailer or something, that would be a spherical diameter. It's 3D. So in any any view, 
top right or center. You would just point to this from any side view or top view. They all look the same. In a cylinder, you want to see the path of that. And I talk about a radiator hose in 1405. You want to see the path of that or the shape of that thing. So we show that from the side view. And then when we're talking about something square, once again, if it has the same tolerance, you can use a square symbol for the X and Y if it is, in fact, the same size. All right. And I think I went through all that. I don't think I missed anything else. So going to the true-false questions... We'll start another video and then you can just watch that to get your true false questions answered. <laughs> 